Hi, everyone. Uh, so great to be here with you all virtually, and thank you so much for joining today's discussion on ways to foster integration in early childhood settings and the implications for policy. Um, I want to thank our co-sponsors, the Century Foundation, New America, and Southern Education Foundation. I am just so thrilled to be here and to be able to moderate this important conversation with a great group of speakers and panelists. And to begin our discussion today, we are joined by Bernadine Futral who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Office of Elementary and Secondary Education at the U.S. Department of Education. Prior to this role, she has held several positions to advance access to early learning opportunities, including directing the Office of Head Start at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and also starting her career in a Head Start program. Bernadine, thank you so much for joining us today to provide opening remarks about federal actions that are currently underway to help frame our conversation and with that, I will pass it over to you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. It's, I'm so honored and thrilled to be with you all today, and I appreciate the opportunity to join this conversation um, really with those researchers and scholars who are on this line that what I call been tilling the land to build the landscape of research for early childhood education. And I'm so pleased to be with you all and you'll hear from them today. Thank you, LPI. Thank you to the Century Foundation and the Southern Education Foundation for convening this conversation um, regarding fostering integration in early childhood education. Prior to my role here at the department and my role that I was very honored to have at leading the Office of Head Start during President Biden's first year, I've studied this question of school integration many years and many times over. And what I've found through research, through conversations with families and my own experience is that every family, every community really want the highest quality education and early learning for their children. And the issue then becomes why is that not available? Is why in our K-12 settings, in our early childhood setting, that's not happening. We understand because of legacy of discrimination, as well as the continued disparities that we see in access, that student readiness in the early grades continue to lag. We know from research that universal, high quality, early childhood education could really eliminate these gaps that we see. That's why I'm very honored and thankful to work and serve, uh, president, serve the president who secured an additional 1.5 billion for the Head Start program, where my heart will always be, and substantial increases to the child care and development block program. I'm also proud of the $24 billion from the American Rescue Plan funding that was used to stabilize child care. Since coming to the Department of Education, this week actually will be my second anniversary, so I'm very excited about that. I brought with me a full commitment and a passion to this concept that every school, every school, every childcare uh, setting, every Head Start is one of excellence for every child, every family, every community. And at the department, we have taken aggressive action during this administration the Department of Education has invested more than $300 million in programs to increase school diversity. This includes our Magnet Schools Assistance Program, as well as our Fostering Diverse Schools Program that was newly created just last year to provide resources for intentional efforts for school diversity. We've also launched, and with great leadership from my colleague Swati, the K-12 Sturdy Bridge Agenda that fully supports our Secretary's call to action to raise the bar on achievement and expectations for every child in every community. We've released the first uh, preschool guidance comprehensively in more than a decade. We're gonna put that in the chat. We really want you to use it, have access to it. Um, and, we, and in addition to that, just few weeks ago, in recognition of the 70th anniversary of the Brown v. Board of Education, we issued a White House fact sheet outlining how this administration has supported efforts for school integration and resource equity, because we know they go hand in hand. Um, we also, with our great co colleagues and my uh, forever family at HHS, issued a dear colleague letter around and encouraging mixed delivery preschool. The list continues, and we're currently seeking new applications for technical assistance centers that's going to be more intentional and support for resource equity, as well as early learning. 
We've also have substantial requests in our president's FY25 budget that includes investments in early childhood education to make it more accessible and more integrated for more children and families. As I close, I know that when we unite around a shared belief, and I, and I want us to unite around the belief that every child, wherever they are, should have access to the highest quality education, the closest child care setting, the closest school should be the best for that child and that family. And I know that when we lean into what works and what we've seen, we can see monumental success in our nation, in our early childhood settings, and in our world, because if we have strong early, we have a strong start in our early childhood education, then we know we're gonna have a strong start in our schools, strong start in our communities and our nation. I know we can do this, we must do this, and I'm very excited for this panel and this conversation coming next. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back to you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, Bernadine, for setting the stage for the discussion that I'll moderate shortly with folks who have been thinking deeply about this issue and ways forward. And I really appreciate the call to action there uh, for unity around high quality ECE for all children. Um, I'll now provide a brief research presentation based on findings from a recent LPI report um, titled Strategies to Foster Integration in Early Childhood Education, or ECE. And the purpose of the report is to highlight the important but often overlooked problem of segregation in ECE and also identify strategies that policymakers and administrators can use to foster integration. So to start, let's discuss why integration in ECE matters. First, research shows that segregation can undermine educational opportunities. And for children of color, segregation is often associated with concentrated poverty and resource inequities. Um, and one thing that we highlight in the report is that segregation is driven by patterns of residential segregation, but it is also driven by policy decisions, which means that this could be redesigned to support greater integration. And we also know that extensive research shows that the academic and social benefits of integrated learning environments from kindergarten through college, finding benefits that range from improved test scores to higher graduation rates and earnings. And emergent research points to benefits of attending integrated early learning settings as well. So research shows that children in more diverse settings had increases in reading, reading language development, and math outcomes. And there are also social benefits of integrated learning environments. For example, exposing children to peers from diverse backgrounds can increase cross-cultural friendships and reduce prejudice. And this is key because research tells us that children start to form ideas about social identity and racial biases early on. And so early childhood experiences can impact beliefs that set the foundation for future interactions. Yet despite the benefits of integration, many young children lack access to such settings. A study of publicly funded preschools, for example, found that nearly half of Black and Latino or Latina children are taught in racially isolated schools, where 90% of students are students of color. And evidence shows that ECE programs are more segregated than K-12 schools. So for example, a study from the Urban Institute found that overall, ECE programs are 20% more segregated than high schools. And one reason this may be the case is because all those state and federal programs fund much needed and important access to ECE, most are not designed to foster integration uh, because of limited resources and investments. Eligibility is often limited to children from low income families and that eligibility threshold varies. So this table shows uh, how different this can vary by some publicly funded programs. And at start, for example, families must have incomes below the federal poverty level. Uh, Child Care Development Fund is for families below 85% of the state median income. For state-funded preschool programs, eligibility is often limited to children from low-income families. But again, that threshold varies, and it's not always the same as other programs like Head Start. 
And then special education funds uh, do not have an income eligibility requirement. So this is just a slice of public programs, but you can see how much uh, this can vary. And this is important because it can be difficult for providers to serve children who may qualify for different funding streams in the same settings, because these programs also have their own set of quality standards or reporting requirements that can be hard to nav navigate. Yet this does not have to be the case. Uh, the report identifies five strategies to foster integration. This includes establishing universal programs, braiding public funding, allowing tuition paying families to enroll in public programs, attracting families across neighborhoods or boundaries, and finally creating two way to language immersion programs. So I'll provide a brief description of each strategy, how we can foster integration, and then also go into some of the common implementation challenges that policymakers should consider. So in recent years, more states and cities across the country are expanding access to publicly funded preschool, with several providing access regardless of income. Uh, eight states and D.C., so these are the states in this darker orange color, have programs that are only limited by age and in which over 50 percent of four-year-olds participate. Other states, those that are in the lighter orange, do not have eligibility requirements but, do, but don't serve most of the four-year-olds in this state just yet. And you can see just how much this varies across the country and the different stages that folks are in. In terms of the promise of this strategy, research has found that universal pre-K can produce large gains for children or larger gains for children than targeted, targeted programs, particularly for children from low-income families. And not surprisingly, this research also shows that universal programs are more diverse because there aren't those eligibility requirements. However, universality alone will not necessarily lead to greater integration, but it can lead to programs that are more integrated than is currently the norm. So for example, studies of New York City's universal pre-K found that while school-based pre-K classrooms were as diverse as first grade, pre-K and community-based organizations were more likely to serve children of color. And another key consideration when establishing universal pre-K is ensuring equitable access to quality. So studies from New York City Georgia, California, show that Asian, Black, and Hispanic children have less access to quality providers than white children, even in programs that have common quality standards. The next strategy we highlight is braiding public funding. As many of you know, the current ECE system in most states is composed of a patchwork of programs, each of which has its own eligibility requirements and program funding. And this figure here shows how multiple federal agencies oversee program administration, including multiple offices in the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Education. Um, and this is looking specifically at California. So for example, state programs are then administered through several agencies, and this continues down to the local level, all to say that this can be really challenging for providers to navigate the subway map of programs. Uh, but braiding public funding is a promising strategy because it enables children who are served by different funding streams to learn together. And many programs already do this work, so it's not new to the ECE field. But doing so can be administratively challenging, in part because of that subway map of programs that I just showed you. Um, often administrators at the provider level must keep track of funding streams and how funding is allocated. And another consideration here is that meeting higher standards can be costly, which braided programs um, usually must meet. And so this is another consideration for policymakers when thinking about ways to incentivize more folks to do this work. Another strategy is allowing tuition paying families to enroll in public programs. So many publicly funded programs, like I've been mentioning, have strict income eligibility requirements, creating an income cliff that disqualifies families who earn even a dollar over the maximum income level. And to mitigate this issue, some programs have one tuition rate for all families who do not qualify for public subsidies. Other programs use a sliding fee scale where families pay progressively more as their income increases. And in some instances, this is already allowable. 
And one policy consideration for this strategy is just it can be difficult to determine how much programs should be allowed to charge families. On one hand, families should not be charged more than they can afford to pay. But if families who are not income eligible pay less than the true cost of the program, they may divert public funding from other participants who do qualify based on need. And given the longstanding impacts of residential segregation, strategies that seek to integrate children across neighborhoods or district boundaries can increase diversity. Uh, some programs use open enrollment practices to allow children to attend a school outside of their local area or locate programs strategically to attract diverse families. And one challenge with this strategy is that creating and maintaining programs um, can be difficult because there's additional resources that are needed uh, to expand capacity. And finally, we identified two-way dual language immersion programs as another strategy because these programs aim to enroll an even mix of native speakers of both English and the program's target language, therefore providing an opportunity for in linguistic integration. Um, and these programs can be particularly beneficial for dual language learners because it supports the continued development of their native language and also honors the children's cultural assets that they bring into the classroom. And there's well-documented benefits of bilingualism that extend to all children. And the demand for a dual language immersion program has created both an opportunity and a challenge for school integration. Uh, one thing that policymakers could consider is ways to support equitable access to maintain the balance of children who are dual language learners and native English speakers. And then another consideration is that using this strategy can be difficult due to a shortage of educators who are trained in bilingual education. So although segregation, excuse me, throughout the interviews with practitioners and policy experts that helped inform this report, several themes came up consistently that are important across all the strategies and learning environments. So this includes uh, fostering culturally responsive learning environments supported by professional development for teachers recruiting and retaining a diverse staff who can work effectively with diverse children and families and engaging families in a way that meets their needs. So again, these are critical components of any learning environment uh, that to enable all children to thrive. So although segregation is the norm in early childhood settings, currently this does not have to be the case. The report provides several policy recommendations to support integration. Uh, this includes to establish universal ECE programs so that a child's family income does not determine where they are enrolled. Braid public funding to enable children from different socioeconomic backgrounds to learn in the same classroom. Build a coherent system of ECE governance and administration. Allow providers to enroll families of all incomes in publicly funded programs while reserving seats for families with low incomes. Support local strategies that draw families from different neighborhoods or district boundaries, including strategically locating programs and offering two-way dual language immersion schools. Using inclusive enrollment practices and clearly communicating ECE options to all families. And then finally, collect enrollment data that's disaggregated by race, ethnicity, language, and socioeconomic status to understand the extent to which children are learning in diverse classrooms. So these recommendations and considerations offer next steps for policymakers. I now want to transition to the panel discussion portion of the webinar, where we'll hear from folks who are putting many of these practices into action. So joining us today, we have Miriam Calderon, who is the Chief Policy Officer at Zero to Three. She has experiences across multiple federal and state agencies. Martha Lee is the Senior Director of Early Childhood at the Educational Alliance at Manny Cantor Center, which is an ECE center in, the, in New York City that intentionally fosters integration. Chantelle Meek is the Executive Director of the Children's Equity Project and a Professor of Practice at Arizona State University. She also has experience at the federal policy level, and her work focuses on closing opportunity gaps. And Casey Stockstill is an assistant professor at Dartmouth College. Her research focuses on race and class equity in preschool. 
Thank you all for sharing your expertise with us today. I will start off our conversation uh, by asking some of the panelists to ground us in the importance of integrated learning environments and what this can look like. Um, so Casey, I'll, I'll start with you. You've spent some time observing how segregation impacts children's experiences in many ways. Uh, can you tell us more about what you found and why integration is an important consideration? Sure. Thanks. Thanks for having me, um, Sarah, and thanks to the audience for being here. So I did research, qualitative research, and I observed in two preschool classrooms. Um, and like the data show, they were very uh, segregated by both race and class. So one of the classrooms I observed was in a private center, and all the families were private pay. Um, the families were all middle class or affluent, and then all but one family was white. The second classroom was a Head Start classroom where all the children came from families in poverty and most children were children of color. So I wanna talk quickly about the challenges of preschools that are segregated by race and class. And I focused on some of the social, uh, social and cultural impacts, um, complementing what Sarah described in terms of academic impacts. So I found that children lost out in both classrooms. In that affluent white classroom, they kind of tried to achieve diversity through diverse books and toys, but that wasn't the same as genuine friendship and connection where children are considering different points of view. So for example, in this affluent white classroom, I observed extended conversations about Disney World and about family vacations, creating a kind of group environment where it's normalized to travel for a family trip. Um, this school also did the, a yearly donation drive to the Head Starts in the city. And so the kids would talk about, oh, we have plenty of stuff here, but there's kids somewhere in the city that don't have enough toys or coats, and isn't that sad? So they're learning a lesson, but it's kind of an abstract one. And then at the Head Start classroom, the main impact that I saw was um, in concentrating poverty-related trauma and fallouts of structural racism. We concentrate these in classrooms. Um, it affected enrollment, so two-thirds of the class roster was stable throughout the year, but a third of that class roster fluctuated in response to families moving or being evicted, right? And we know that frequent moves and eviction, those things happen more to Black, Hispanic families and to families in poverty. I also saw impacts on behavior. So most of the classroom adjusted to the classroom routine, but there were always a group of kids on a given day kind of acting out. Um, and sometimes this related to stress at home. So for example, a kid named Julian, that's a pseudonym, his mom went to jail. And while she was gone, he would jump off bookshelves, hit peers, and jog the classroom, right? So these are things that take teachers' time and attention to help children. Um, and what I want to kind of advocate for is thinking about the ways that we are concentrating uh, children in different classrooms, and that affects how children experience the space and also teachers and their work. Um, so I think that it's important because this is the first group learning environment for two thirds of four year olds in the US, right? It's not kindergarten, it's early learning settings. I think children stand to benefit in important social ways from diverse environments. And I think um, teachers can rise to the challenge of incorporating a diverse range of children in their classroom. Uh, so my new project is examining these same dynamics, but across a bigger range of schools. And I really focus on private community-based centers um, so I um, like have been talking with 50 of these types of centers in Denver, and I have been excited to learn about the promises of programs that are able to do the blending and braiding required. Uh, that means that children from all kinds of families can attend. Uh, so three potential benefits I see. One, if a family's income rises or falls in, in segregated programs, it can mean kids have to leave, right? So if your kid goes to a very expensive private program, and a parent loses a job, they might have to disenroll or unenroll. Um, or maybe you're a college student uh, and a single parent and you qualify for Head Start, but then you graduate and you've got a higher paying job and now you don't qualify. Um, we see those impacts in segregated programs, but when there's a program that blends and braids funding, a family can be a family at that center all the way till their kid you know, goes to kindergarten. The second benefit I'm, I'm noticing in talking to some of these directors is families can share social capital. So there might be um, a parent at a center who runs a business and they're hiring and they connect with a parent who needs a job, right? Who maybe has a lower income. Um, and lastly, children have this opportunity to have inclusive relationships 
with friends that have all kinds of different perspectives. And I know we have someone here, right, from Andy Cantor, who can talk about um, their experiences running this type of program. So. Thank you, Casey. And it's really exciting to hear um, some of that new work that's that's ongoing for you. And Martha, I want to pass it over to you. I know your work at the Manny Cantor Center focuses on ensuring that children from diverse socioeconomic backgrounds can learn together, which includes braiding various public funding. Um, can you start our, our conversation by describing what inclusive classrooms look and feel like at the center? Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to do that. So what you'll see when you come to our Early Childhood Center is children learning in a responsive and loving environment, just like in many programs across the city. But what will be more atypical is that our world inside the classroom, both students and teachers, more closely mirrors our larger community outside of the building. So New York City is one of the most diverse cities in the world, but what you know if you live here is that we live in pockets of homogeneity in these larger neighborhoods. And so at a young age, those pockets can be your whole world and life experience. Um, and we believe that if we create a learning environment that challenges these separations that have become acceptable in the city, we can work to normalize true diversity and inclusion in our schools, which we believe is more than just racial diversity. It's socioeconomic diversity, family constellation diversity, foundational belief diversity. Um, and the truth is that this vision that we have of a deeply diverse and equitable school environment is not an easy one to actualize but we can see the benefits to our children and families. So a parent recently told me the story about how she took her child to a playground in Brooklyn and there were a group of children and parents who were all white and they were playing in one part of the park. And then there was another group of children um, and families of color who were playing in another area of the park. And her child who's white went to play with that group of the children of color. Um, she's attended our schools since she was a baby and she's created relationships with the children here. And so it felt completely within her realm of experience to approach a group of racially diverse children to play. And so this parent was talking to me and had kind of wondered aloud, you know, if, if my child had attended a different kind of preschool, would she have made the same choice on the playground that day? Um, and so we also know it's really critical for supporting this vision to have families get to know each other when they may not have occasion to meet outside of the school setting. You know, and we've seen this happen in beautiful ways where families just being exposed to each other through the school can create really organic, wonderful relationships. But what I have to be honest about is that, you know, we're still definitely learning how to, you know, support those meaningful connections in really intentional and authentic ways, because there are all of these separation points that exist kind of outside of our, our little world here. Um, and real relationships just help us all deepen our understanding of each other and help us to walk towards this common goal and shared vision that we have. So we're really committed to it, um, but it's really complex. And I cannot say that we have a magic answer about that, but we know that it's critical um, to actualize what we're trying to do here at the school. Thank you, Martha, so much. And um, so the audience just heard what creating and sustaining diverse and inclusive learning environments can look like in practice um, and the importance of doing so. Uh, let us now talk about different policy strategies that federal, state, and local policymakers can, can take to get there. Um, so Chantal, I want to pass it over to you. You have experience at multiple levels of governments. And as you know, we've talked about this issue of the income cliff that disqualifies family uh, for public like programs and um, sometimes targeted programs can often lead to socioeconomic segregation. Um, you know, can you discuss how braiding and blending funding can promote integration um, and also the role of a coherent system of ECE governance and administration? Hi, Sarah, and hi, everyone. Uh, glad to be with you all today. I think it's important just to start with the policy discussion with just a bit of framing that is probably a given, but we of course have steep gerrymandering of school boundary zones, right? We know that schools are more segregated than the communities in which they're housed. And just like political gerrymandering exists to hoard resources and power, school boundary gerrymandering is kind of the, the same type of thing where we are, where there is an organized effort to resist the very thing that we're talking about to hoard opportunity and resources. So we know that there's a history of white flight of redlining of all these different pieces that contributed to housing segregation and to where we're at now that deeply impact 
segregation at the in the learning settings, right? So I think it's important to take that into account and understand that there's going to be organized pushback, right? As there always is. And so to this point of governance that you just mentioned, I think to the leadership point, right? These policies have to be intentional. They have to be on purpose. They're going to be hard. They have to be courageous, right? Because there is going to be pushback. Um, it's not just about cost allocating, which I will talk about in just a second, and then the nitty gritties of like how we do that and how we figure out how to blade and brand. But it's really understanding the broader political dynamic of where we're at and how those different policies are gonna be met. So I think to the blending and braiding point, I think you're absolutely right. Like this does not have to be the case. Uh, even in Head Start, as we saw with, with the example that we just heard from, too often we're segregating because it's easier accounting or there are policy misperceptions or there are not the, the kind of administrative and budget staff in programs to figure out the complexity of the different funding streams and eligibility and all of those other pieces that you mentioned um, in your presentation. But we can begin to do that, right? We can blend where we combined federal, state, local parent fees even to ensure that we're aligning to the highest standard, which is most often the Head Start standards. We can cost allocate and braid, right, within a classroom by looking at the proportion of kids, the types of allowable expenses. Like this is hard and complicated and requires resources and TA, but it's also doable, right, as, as we've seen with the appropriate supports. We know that the Office of Head Start recently received, uh, published their notice for proposed rulemaking and included some language on socioeconomic integration, which is a helpful step in the right direction, but the field could use a lot more federal guidance and TA to help move us in that direction. Um, I think the last thing that I'll mention is the Early Head Start Child Care Partnerships. Um, as a model as a, and a specific funding stream that we could be thinking about as leveraging for this purpose. Um, back in 2014, during the Obama administration, we established this program as kind of a competitive option underneath the broader Head Start program where there would be federal funding used to partner early Head Start providers with child care partners who would agree to meet the early Head Start standards and of course have the resources to do so, right? And of course you have um, more mixed income settings there because a lot of these child care programs don't have those really rigid eligibility uh, criteria with respect to income. So I think for the first time there was like this explicit funding stream with time and place and direction from the feds to bring together these two programs with very different funding streams, eligibility criteria, all the things that we already talked about, right? Um, the primary goal wasn't really socioeconomic integration at a high level, although it was one of them, but it was providing a consistent level of care across these different types of system, which often have very different um, levels of quality. So I think when we have that in mind and we the feds could write that in, right, as part of the expectation for early Head Start child care partnerships, um, that could take us further in really using that model. And the last thing I'll say, I, I know I already said that, but there's no reason why we can apply the same type of model for preschool age kids with Head Start Child Care Partnership, Head Start Pre-K Partnerships, Head Start Kindergarten Partnerships, right? Where we think about these models where we're bringing together um, aligning quality um, and integrating at the, at the local level. And we've published some on that. So I will include some of those links in the chat um, for more. Thank you so much, Chantal. And uh, Miriam, I, I wanna pass it over to you. Um, and focusing on your previous role as a director of ECE at the District of Columbia Public Schools, where you helped imp implement the district's uh, universal pre-K program and led efforts to braid um, federal Head Start funding um, to create the Head Start school-wide model. Um, I'm hoping that you can describe uh, what that model aimed to do um, and then what it took to get there. Sure, absolutely. Well, thanks, Sarah. And I'm I'm really honored and excited to still be talking about the Head Start school-wide model, um, like over a decade um, since um, it was established, and especially with folks like Casey and Martha um, and Chantel who are um, in this work um, uh, currently. Um, so I'll I'll describe the Head Start uh, school-wide model first, very very briefly. Um, and say that um, Head Start, um, the District of Columbia Public Schools had both a Head Start program that it had since the late 60s, and, um, and then we had the flexibility and availability uh, for our school system to be able to support um, pre-K, primarily for four-year-olds. Um, and these programs had coexisted um, for a really long time, um, for decades. And um, what the Head Start school-wide model 
um, at its most basic level aimed to do was be able to integrate um, both programs and build a unified early childhood education program for the District of Columbia Public Schools. So we um, had the Head Start uh, performance standards apply to all of the pre-K classrooms, both three and four-year-old um, pre-K classrooms across all of the Title I schools. And we called it school-wide because they were really school-wide approaches. We were able to blend and break funds to be able to support meeting the performance standards across all of those schools and classrooms. Um, to give you some numbers and facts at the time, um, we had about 54 elementary schools that had some number of Head Start labeled classrooms um, in them, and we had about 84 elementary uh, schools at the time in the city. So uh, we reached a little over 1,000 children. That was our funded enrollment for Head Start um, in those Head Start labeled classrooms in those schools. Um, after this Head Start school-wide model was implemented, we went to um, all of the Title I schools uh, being able to um, meet the Head Start performance standards. And so our reach went from a little over 1,000 to about 4,000 children and families um, benefiting from an early education experience, a preschool experience that met the Head Start performance standards. So very much getting at some of what um, Chantel was talking about in terms of partnerships. I think the unique thing about the DCPS Head Start school-wide model at the time was this was all within the same school district, right? But I'll get to some of those community level implications um, in a second. Um, and uh, I'll just say, in terms of context, the city was undergoing significant reforms. We had established the SEA, which because DC is a unique city-state jurisdiction, we needed to do some separation at the time. We brought in mayoral control, abolished the school board. There was a significant investment in the expansion of charters. And early childhood um, advocates at the time in the city saw all of these efforts around education reform as an opportunity to expand um, early childhood education education for young children. Again, there was already pre-K and Head Start um, in the city and in the public schools. I think the difference here was getting the goal of universal pre-K into this legislation um, to really close an access gap. There was a number that was utilized a lot, um, 2,000 children um, who weren't um, benefiting from pre-K in the city. And those were mainly three-year-olds. So that was a big goal, right? 2,000 reach, close that access gap. The other one I'd be remiss in not um, calling out, which I think we've come to another time in our, um, in sort of our policy and political landscape where this is uh, really um, prevalent, not that it's gone away, was to bring families back into the K-12 system. Um, so there were declining enrollments in the city. We're seeing that again at the elementary school level and concerns about that. And so pre-K, I think really politically was seen I think we would all want to say it was, of course, because we know this lays the foundation for all later learning, but I think there was some real attention to the fact that this was going to be a very uh, attractive strategy to really be able to bring more families back into the K-12 system. Um, and I'll say again, um, you know, for me, the unified early childhood education and many of the leaders I was working with inside the system and outside, it was hugely important, right, to be able to get at those issues of separate enrollments and eligibility criteria, um, building, um, you know, separating children based on income in the same, within the same school by classrooms, again, those Head Start labeled classrooms. Um, to be able to bring in the best practices that we know uh, exist in the Head Start, um, you know, that really rep are represented in the Head Start performance standards. So the attention to health, social, emotional development, family support was all a really big goal. Um, I would also be remiss in saying um, we were a very low performing Head Start grantee at the time. Um, and this um, I use, I refer to the Head Start opt out provision, right? So as we brought in UPK in the city, um, and there was more of an effort on opening more pre-K classrooms. Um, it was really, really, um, it was, it was uh, concerning for Head Start. Um, and the more we would push, which you know, it takes work to implement those performance standards um, on some of those practices. We had building leaders at the time that would say, you know what, I don't want Head Start. My classroom, and for them, they were still going to be able to serve three and four-year-old family, children and families, right? Because they were going to do it as another funding stream. So I think, you know, different leaders at the time would have said, no loss, we're still serving three and four-year-olds. But if you believe that equity is not just about access, equity is about what children and families experience, how you support educators, then I saw that as a problem. And 
again, the Head Start Performance Standards gave us a really good framework and funding to be able to really support, um, a, you know, developmentally appropriate practice, integrated health, family support, and those are things we wanted to scale across our system. And um, I would say that the whole idea of just putting all the Head Start kids in one classroom wasn't working. We had 2,000, we estimated between 1,500 and 2,000 Head Start income eligible families that were in those labeled Head Start classrooms, right? So um, we needed to be able to get them the kinds of additional services um, and supports and those best practices. So that was a big part of the work too. I'm going to just go really quickly here. Maybe we can get into some of the lessons learned. I think they will go to some of the recommendations I would have for change. But um, one of the biggest challenges was building, um, communicating and building buy-in for a shared vision. We had multiple audiences, families, educators, school building leaders, our own Head Start staff, right, who were who were distrustful, right, about some of these changes and our ability really to have them work. Our federal partners, right, we were a low performing Head Start grantee. And I was basically saying to them, we couldn't do it that well in you know, for a thousand families, but trust us, we can do it for 4,000, right? But like the scale and making those the standard and the foundation was key to that. Um, and, uh, you know, our political leaders, et cetera. So lots of audiences. Um, that was, I think, everything else you could problem solve around, right? So we had to figure out how to do cost allocation, like Chantel talked about. We had to figure out how to do income verification, right? To go for universal, you don't have to show income, but we still needed to be able to prove we were serving Head Start income eligible families. If I had started asking every single family in the school system to bring their pay stubs to enrollment, I would have been like thrown out of town, right? So all of that we problem solved around um, how to do family style meals how to have the co collective bargaining agreement, support home visits, right? All of this could be problem solved around if we all had shared buy-in um, and, um, and commitment to implementing this vision. So I'd say that's what we needed to change the mindset and behavior shifts. There's a lot more to say there, but um, I'm, um, you know, again, I have lots more I can sort of share um, related to uh, what the impacts were on infant toddler care, community-based programs, I would say, um, infrastructure to support real family choice, which was a big value at the time, um, is, is, was, would be a do-over for me. So we were not coordinating across sectors, DCPS and community-based programs. Um, the way we funded um, the community-based providers uh, was different than how the schools and charters got their funding for pre-K that had impact on community-based programs and infant toddler care in the city. Lots of uh, lessons learned around governance um, and I think ways in which we could have taken this to be a more community citywide, not just one sector-wide approach, but I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Miriam. Yeah. And I'm happy that, you know, folks are still having a conversation about the school-wide model because I often refer to it as well. Um, and so thanks for all the innovative work there. And um, I know there are some questions around creating buy-in with parents and community members. So that was also really helpful. Um, Martha, I want to pass it back to you. Um, and, you know, earlier you painted a picture of, of what this looks like in practice and you're, you do the work daily. Um, you know, can you tell us about what it takes to make this work um, and what policy changes or supports would make Make this easier for you? Yeah, I think um, those are really great questions. And just in terms of like administratively, it's a complex system. So I think both Chantal and Miriam alluded to that in, in their, you know, really wonderful answers. Um, there's a lot that goes on in terms of accounting. And we, the, sort of my best and simplest answer on how we do this is that we have a really great team in place. Um, and what I mean by a great team is that they all have the knowledge that they need that um, would allow us to meet all of the different requirements from all of the different funders, which is really complex because sometimes there are sort of competing requirements. And so we have to make decisions on our team about sort of well, what do we think this means? And, and okay, this, this sort of these standards mean this and this protocol says this and how do we sort of, what do we follow and what do we do? Um, and so just in terms of like, you know, our enrollment and admissions process, like everybody is on the whole team is up to date on ERSI 
um, all the ERSI qualifications and standards, even though half of our children in our infants, toddlers, and twos program are tuition based. Um, that we still, everyone still understands what all of the policies and procedures are. And so I think that's a really important part of what we do here. We have a separate finance team that does um, kind of handles all the complexities of the accounting pieces of having a braided funded program. So we have city contracts, federal contracts, and then the private pay tuition. Um, you know, this New York City current administration um, has not been the most supportive of early childhood as, as previous ones have. And so I think that's an overall challenge, but I think, um, you know, as Chantal also alluded to in her answer previously, like for us, what would make things so much easier is if those different funding sources actually worked together to create some kind of a crosswalk of their different requirements, standards, rules, policies, and protocols, because as a program that's trying to follow all of those um, you know, different things that are in place, it's very challenging sometimes for us to sort of be at the fidelity level for all of the different requirements. And so if there was a more cohesive kind of one thing that um, these agencies could collaborate together to present to programs, I think that would be uh, really beneficial. And I think that a lot more programs would be willing to sort of take that step in because there was more of a roadmap that was laid out. Um, for us, there's times where we feel like we're like, just trying to figure out which map to take. So, you know, it would be much more helpful if there was something that was cohesive and sort of grounded in all of the different practices that could help guide us. Thank you, Martha. And um, we do have about like four to five more minutes left in the panel discussion. And um, just want to keep that in mind just so that we have enough time to get to some questions that have been coming up in the chat. And my next question is for you, Chantel. So I know your research focuses on ensuring equitable access to dual language immersion programs. And can you speak a little bit about that research and, and how it can be used to foster integration? Sure, and I'll, I'll try to be super quick. Um, we have a strong body of evidence that bilingualism is good and associated with a range of important outcomes, cognitive in early childhood, academic in the school years, academic in the long term. Um, we also have evidence that shows that children in dual language programs outperform their peers in English only programs in math and in English by the end of elementary school and English learners exit from English learner status faster when they have access to their home language and are in dual language programs. We also have research in the early years that, that I won't go into, but this issue of access to those programs, right, has been a very controversial one when we think about, um, I think we have to start with the statement that English learners or emergent bilingual kids in the early years have a lot more to gain and a lot more to lose from having or lacking access to these programs. That is for this group of kids, it isn't about enrichment, it's about base access to the curriculum, to the teacher, to the content, right? For kids who already speak English, the stakes are not as high. It's a wonderful enrichment that is associated with a bunch of really good things, but it doesn't make or break basic access to the learning opportunity and to the education. So in a place where we have scarcity of DL seats, right, we have the re very real tension of who gets access because we don't have enough of it to go around. Um, so earlier this year, we partnered with the Century Foundation to look at this very issue of enrollment and equitable enrollment and who is in these seats um, in different programs across the country. Um, and we also looked at the question of how that imp impacts segregation or integration and what those numbers look like inside and outside of DL programs. And in lots of communities, when you looked at D school, D, uh, dual language schools, they were more integrated and there was more diversity within those schools than in non-dual language schools. Again, though, when we look at the grand scheme of the number of schools that are dual language, it's like very, very small compared to the rest of the universe. Um, I think when we think about the benefits and potential levers of dual language being used for integration, we have to also maintain and hold at the same time a focus on ensuring that ELs and bilingual kids are prioritized in these seats um, and making sure that we're seeing it as access to education, not just enrichment and pulling uh, other kids in. And so I think the way forward is really thinking about how we increase the number of seats and increase availability 
prioritizing kids who are speaking a language other than English at home, and secondarily aiming for that socioeconomic and language and racial diversity within those programs that also includes English dominant kids who have traditionally been underrepresented in these opportunities, including black children, other children of color, children with disabilities, um, and ensuring that we have appropriate resources to ensure that we're still um, providing opportunity for those the furthest from opportunity first that goal of, of increased integration. Thank you, Chantel. And, and next, I'll, I'll pass it over to Casey. Um, you know, in your uh, research, you highlight the importance of uh, universal access, and especially in a mixed delivery approach. Um, and then I'm hoping you can also talk about um, some of the shifts that are need needed in early learning environments to become more inclusive and culturally responsive. Sure, yeah. And I think we've talked a lot about mixed delivery. So I want to just underline two things about that. One being when states or cities roll out a mixed delivery universal preschool program, um, I think there needs to be more work to consider family child care homes or home-based programs and community-based centers. How do they already enroll children and engage with families, right? And how can we not roll out UPK in a way that asks private providers to act like they're in the school district? Because the administrative kind of makeup of a small private program is very different than a, a K-12 school. Um, the other thing I wanna underline is, um, it, it seems like a really class-focused approach to say, let's aim for UPK, um, or let, let's blend and braid funding to increase access, but there is a huge racial implication. And that is because, as we know, we have structural racism that's created income and wealth gaps, right? And so that means Black, Hispanic, Indigenous families, and some Asian families have lower median earnings and household wealth that they would be drawing upon to afford preschool, right? So when we consider income-based eligibility, when we open that up, um, it's kind of a necessary ingredient for making racially diverse programs. And so the action here is the one we've all talked about, which is um, supporting mixed delivery and also helping programs deal with that administrative burden of blending and braiding funding. The second question was, you know, what shifts do we need in early learning environments to make them inclusive and culturally responsive? And I think this answers somewhat um, Angelina's question in the chat. Um, so the next question to ask, right, is if if a program now can accept diverse funding streams and hopefully is, well, it is able to enroll families of color or a more diverse group of families, is it actually a welcoming space for those families? And I can say, so I'm a Black mom with Black kids who went to majority white preschools and they've been, at best, they've been like kind of colorblind and silent on race. And at worst, they've been the place where my kids have their first microaggressions. Um, and so I, I've also, in my ongoing project in Denver, I've seen the limits of anti-bias training. Um, so some of the teachers I speak to took an anti-bias training, said that it was informative and good. And then later in our interview, they tell me about an anti-Black bias incident in their classroom, but they don't call it that. They explain it as being something else and tell me why they didn't address it as a racial thing. And so there's work needing to be done to like connect the links for teachers. So my three kind of ideas, three things that we definitely should focus on, and I'm thinking here of the majority white community-based programs, right? Um, reflective coaching, something to help teachers connect the dots between the, these one-time trainings that are becoming more popular and their classroom. The second thing is like program level changes for equity. So not the, the personal anti-bias stuff, but like asking programs to consider, how do you market to families? How do you enroll them? Um, how is that maybe not welcoming to lower income families, right? If you say you take childcare subsidies, but you've never had a family ask you to use it, you know? What are you communicating about your program that's maybe off-putting to those families? Um, and then also on a practice level, like moving beyond the books and the materials, which those are incentivized by quality rating systems, but I'm seeing a heavy uh, rel reliance on saying, we've got diverse books, we've got brown dolls in the play area, um, but teachers are very reluctant, at least in my research, to use those to even have a conversation about the actual kids in the classroom and what they notice and they see. So. We need to get kind of the step two. And then I won't go into this last one, but I think many of us know that we have a discipline uh, problem in preschool where Black children are suspended and expelled at higher rates. So we need um, restorative justice practices and supports to deal with potentially challenging behaviors so that 
we don't send kids of color to majority white programs where they're just going to get suspended, right? Thanks so much, Casey. And and the final question for our discussion, um, I'm going to pass it over to you, Miriam, just zooming out on your previous roles and picking up on the threads that uh, the amazing panelists have talked about today. You know, What other federal and state level actions do you think can be taken uh, to support these efforts? Sure. Um, so I want to come back to one point I made, which was around coordinated um, enrollment infrastructure. So you see this in states investing in preschool development grants or community led efforts are really taking a look at how are we, how are families finding out about their options and their choices in a community. And the, I think the point there is like, that's an infrastructure that we need to build. It needs to be very close to where providers are and families are and the places where they're getting information about programs. Um, and it needs to cross all of these different funding silos and program settings and be inclusive. Our vision is mixed delivery systems, um, while our policy and funding obviously needs to be more streamlined and um, coherent. Um, so that burden to sort of do this kind of integration doesn't rest on programs themselves. Um, but we do need to think about this as an essential infrastructure. Um, and, um, you know, so again, how families find out, how they enroll, how, how is that designed with family input, um, with provider input, and on the back end, we need to be that system uh, coordinated enrollment infrastructure really helps support and make sure that all of the available public funding streams in a community are being leveraged, right, to, to be able to support choice for families. Um, I'd love to see us move to community level prioritization, whether that's state funded ECE, federally funded ECE, but, um, you know, really moving away from the individual family circumstances um, and determining their eligibility and really being able to say is, you know, how do we look at um, entire communities and think about where we put our dollars first or like who's, who's prioritized um, and, and think about it from community level conditions, again, and moving away from individual circumstance. Um, I think, you know, the cost of care, we're seeing a lot more shifts in this uh, direction, um, but we have to start funding ECE at what it really costs, right, to maintain um, a, a, a qualified, uh, diverse um, workforce. Um, and to be able to provide the supports to families and particularly building an equity into that. And so I think a lesson learned from me is, you know, one universal funding stream, like in my DC experience, um, can shift the way other funding streams are, are utilized. So in DC, Early Head Start expanded significantly, right, because of universal pre-K. Um, I talked before about losses in infant toddler child care. I don't think we did enough, um, but we did see significant expansion of Early Head Start. So looking at that at a community level, though, um, leadership on the ground, I think we need to, at the federal level, we need to lean into the federal Head Start performance standards um, and our vision of mixed delivery and make sure that's getting to all of our partners, particularly our K-12 leaders. Like they are part of a mixed delivery system. Um, infrastructure for planning and systems building. So I think blending and braiding, again, needs its own infrastructure. It shouldn't be happening at the program level. Um, I think we need families and communities part of the planning. Do we have the slots in this community? Are they not just in slots? Again, access versus quality. Equity is as much about where the slots are. Are they meeting families' needs and preferences? Bilingual programs, uh, families with diverse scheduling needs, right? All of these, we need to empower them as decision makers. I mean, I think there's lots of opportunities to blend and braid with Funds like Medicaid for early intervention or, or early childhood special, special ed. So this planning and systems infrastructure is huge. Um, last two points, I think we need to go at the early education and care divide. So Build Back Better was going to bring in a new universal ECE funding stream, but actually two. So we have to think about a new funding stream at the federal level um, in that doesn't, you know, that helps build coherence across the other ones and how they're impacted. Um, and that gets to governance, which is my last point. So community governance, uh, state level governance and federal level governance, right? Including, I think, um, a permanent um, durable infrastructure at the Department of Ed and HHS um, to be able to better coordinate these programs. Thank you, Miriam. Um, and I know we are running uh, 
very short on time. It's been an amazing conversation. And just for folks who are, are joining, just know that we are taking note of all the questions. And uh, this is definitely an ongoing conversation. Um, you know, I'll ask one last question that came in through the chat and hoping that we can get through this very quickly. Um, so, um, one question is around, you know, the family and community benefits and, you know, supports um, that can be made to meeting the needs of linguistically diverse families. Um, and so, you know, Martha, maybe you can, you know, speak to that and then I'll pass it over to anyone else who wants to chime in here in terms of the family engagement piece and, and important elements to consider there. Yeah, so it is challenging. So at our center, we have sort of equal amounts of families that speak Chinese as their primary language uh, because we're on the Lower East Side bordering Chinatown as we do families who speak Spanish primarily and then English. So all of our communications go out in three languages. When we have a family association meeting, we have staff members who speak Spanish and Chinese on the line doing direct translation. Um, we do them virtually for that reason so that they can do that translation piece. Um, but it is, it's challenging. It's challenging because when we're trying to create connections, if there's a language barrier, um, it's, if we're not there, the school staff is not there to facilitate those conversations, it's difficult for those families to connect. So for sure, there are some things that we do, you know, we use an app that communicates in all of the languages. So we try to deliver all of our information trilingually, but that doesn't address the issue of families actually making those meaningful connections on their own if their sort of shared language is not English. And so, you know, I would love to say that I had an answer for that and we don't, we're definitely still working that out. Thank you so much, um, Martha. And I, I just want to note that we are uh, a bit over time here. So I want to wrap us up and just thank you all so much for sharing uh, the work that you've been doing, the work that you continue to do. And one thing that's really clear is that this is long-term intentional work. And um, I just really appreciate you all joining us and look forward to continue to working on this issue with you all. And, and thank you so much, everyone, for joining.